he is. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the Vermont House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. Um, we just finished our break. We're back um, to have some discussions with um, with some of our business um, people um, in the minority world um, that uh, we want to try to uh, see what we can do to um, provide some support for them. Um, so we have a number of people with us. Um, and I think we're, we have a number of people that are having some internet uh, stability problems this morning, uh, which is understandable. Uh, we, uh, we all got kicked off of, of Zoom and, and the internet yesterday morning for some reason. We still aren't sure why. Um, so I think, uh, Charles, we have you up first. If you would uh, like to, uh, we'd like to just, I think, have a discussion with all of you, trying to understand what what can we do to support um, support your efforts um, and to support the BIPOC commun business community. Um, I know that when last year when the uh, grants um, went out. Um, we had provided um, a separate amount of money for women owned and, and minority owned businesses. Um, but I think it was very difficult for the, the agency um, understand just how many um, of businesses we have out there that are minority owned. Um, and um, we were thinking that we may need to um, try to assist you um, in providing maybe um, some financial support into one of your organizations that can help bring you bring everything together and um, actually help you access um, what is out there that the state provides and other, other organizations around the state provide for the business community. Um, so if, uh, We'd like to hear from you what your thoughts are, how we might be able to do that. Um, you know, is it needed? Um, and if it is, then, then how, how can we help you do that? So good morning and thank you all for coming. We, we appreciate your time. Hi, good morning and thank you for having us. Um, I just wanted to maybe start off by just getting a better sense of what the, the bill the proposed bill is just so that at least we have a better sense of what it is that we're commenting against. Because uh, um, this is my first time sort of getting being engaged in all of this and I'm not sure exactly what it is that you're looking for so that I can give you guys at least a better sense of what it is that I would like to get out of this. Well, I think we're, we're trying to understand um, trying to help the, the, the minority community, business community, um, better access all the, the, um, all the, the different programs that the state provides and that our regional development corporations provide for the business community, along with, uh, you know, there's SBA and, and uh, SBDC and, and lots of other different, um, um, areas that that people can find um, technical support, um, also um, you know with money support, that type of thing, and we want to make sure that I think we found um, during the last uh, during the last um, uh, COVID relief dollars that were put out. Um, that the state didn't really know um, how many uh, minority-owned businesses we actually have. Um, and I think that was that because of the unknown, it was hard to get the money out to everyone. And so um, we're, I think we're asking you, what, what do you need um, and are you having trouble, or people having trouble accessing the state? Number one, um, our thoughts are that we would we can provide 
um, some grant dollars to an organization that could hire someone that could um, work with with the with the uh, community, the BIPOC community, business community, in you know where do you go for technical assistance? Um, um, where can you go to um, you know get some some loans, that type of thing, um, and you know help people work their way around government. So that's that's kind of what we're thinking of, um, but we're not sure if we're on the right track or not. Hey Tino, maybe I can jump in real quick if if you want. I can I can break the ice. Sure, go for it. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. My name is Emiliano Void. I'm a Burlington resident. I've been in Vermont for about five years, six years now. Um, I put together this project called the Black Financial Alliance, which aimed to bring together the Black community from an entrepreneurial standpoint, uh, service of professional standpoint, as well as Black-focused organizations. So really trying to create this kind of centralized representation for the community across the board. Um, I'm in favor of, uh, of the bill that's being proposed, uh, not only to provide BIPOC-owned businesses with technical assistance, financial literacy, digital literacy, as well as marketing, but also to promote state and federal contract bid opportunities for BIPOC-owned businesses and to provide training to business for technical assistance providers and reduce bias in service delivery. Um, I don't claim to speak for my community as a whole, um, but certainly I have been fortunate enough to be involved with some community leaders and some organizing work in Burlington in particular and, and some of, of Vermont in a greater capacity. Um, I think something that's interesting is, is regardless of the efforts being put forward by the states, the effectiveness of the way that these funds are making their way into the Black community or at least the BIPOC community, and I can only speak from my lived experience, um, I think it has proven to be not as effective as necessary. Um, I think if you contrast and juxtapose the efforts that were put forward to pre create and provide financial support for the female owned businesses, I think the take rate for that was considerably higher, considerably greater than what happened on the BIPOC side of the fence, which leads me to believe it's not a question of the efforts, it's a question of the vehicle that you folks are using to get the information and access to capital into the communities. Um, so from that capacity, when I look at something like this, if there's not a clear different approach on how we can get the dollars to the people that need them, I think that there's an opportunity for this to fall flat again to some extent. So as much as I'm in support of this bill, I would encourage everybody that's here to proactively find creative solutions in order for us to create clear paths from getting access to the state or access to the funding that the state is providing, whether it's from a technical standpoint, a literacy standpoint, or a financial standpoint, and find the right vehicle to drive that into the community. Um, I am involved in some conversations and some communications with community leaders pretty much across the board in Burlington, and it's only through those very specific channels that my, me, myself, I had heard about this funding, this round that's coming through as well. So if it's not coming from me, at least from my lived experience, if it's not coming from other people that are in the know that things like this are happening, the message is very clearly not getting across to the community as a whole. And I think that's a direct reflection of the take rate of the funding that was provided from the prior round of funding that was solicited by the state. Um, so I would encourage, again, I, I think the efforts are good. I think they're very much needed, but I think the vehicle or the channels that you folks are using in order to get this further into the Black community and, and the BIPOC community, I guess, have not proven effective thus far. And if we're going to put together an effort like this and something sizable of this nature, I think it's critically important that the channels that we use to actually execute are accurate and are effective. So that is my two cents on it. And I guess I'll take a pause to take a breath. <laughs> I'd like to follow up on that. I completely agree. Um, oh, sorry. My name is Weiwei Wong. I'm with the Vermont Professionals of Color Network. I completely agree with what Emiliano has said. I have also heard from uh, small business owners um, around the state that, yes, there are grants offered, but the barriers to those grants is significant for business, small business owners who are taking care of everything. Um, specifically, I was talking to one business owner who, you know, she's doing everything herself, marketing, um, business planning, everything. And she does not have time to apply for the grants. So meaning that the application for the grant itself is a barrier. So that's another reason why, you know, not only do we not know about it, but when we do know about it, even taking the time to apply for it, because I am not sure exactly what questions are being asked, but there are specific, you know, um, needs that the grants have 
in order to for the business person to receive the grant, right? And so that becomes a barrier as well. So there, there are several hoops that people have to jump through in order to actually get to the money. Charlie? Great. Um, can I chime in? Um, I think uh, Representative Kimball has a question, Curtis. And, uh, OK. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Emiliano and Weiwei, thank you. Um, I'm curious because we really want to understand the obstacles that you might have run into personally too, uh, and looking at the um, things that were extended, the programs that were extended um, to understand better that standing up a separate organization would help address them. Um, so um, trying to get a better understanding of actual experience that you've had and how we can learn from that. So I was, I'm hoping that when we have this discussion, you can share that because that's for us the most powerful um, in terms of real life examples. Uh, I can, I've got, this is Tino Tanner again. Um, I've got an example just personally in my life, uh, not really related to uh, business, a business that I own, which I do all my own personal business, but just in terms of my career, um, sometimes in life, you need somebody to take a chance on you and to give you that opportunity. And this is exactly what's happened when you think of a lot of big, a lot of big businesses that have formed uh, in our community, it required somebody to actually do something or take, take that opportunity to take a chance on somebody. Um, I got my break when somebody uh, who saw the, the, the potential in me said like, hey, I want you to come and work for my organization. And then that then led to me finding my, my foothold in, 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 um, in, in the private sector and starting to show what I was capable of. And then before you know it, you get a promotion, you start to then get other suitors coming in and you know you, you, you go from being a minimum age earner to, to however amount of money you, you make. That's sort of what we want to have in the business community where you know, either the, the government uh, contracts or, 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 or bids where we, we, we aren't looked at as like mom and pop shops, but somebody then says like, hey, you know what? You've got the potential to become an SD island because the little work you're doing here, if we gave you something big, you can take it and, and run with it. And that's really what I think is missing right now is people actually taking a chance on some of these small businesses and giving them the opportunities to go from being a mom and pop shop to being a, 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 a larger employer. Because right now, the way things are, the contracts, the bids, everything are still going to the same old players, which are continually becoming bigger and bigger corporations in Vermont. And it's the same old people that keep benefiting from the system. Curtis? Yes. Um, good morning. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. Uh, I, I'd like to start by addressing some of the pushback um, indirect and direct that I've received about the notion of positioning the AC, ACCD as the, uh, as the home of uh, technical assistance, literacy, um, and digital literacy uh, in the state. And I, I believe Amy has circulated to you already uh, is the 1991 executive order from uh, Governor Dean Yes. That clearly states that, that there ought to be and there should be, um, you know, a, a focal point within AC, ACCD's predecessor, uh, specifically around minority owned businesses. Um, I hope any discussion or conversation that you might have that ACCD is not the entity. Uh, should be dispelled. Uh, we believe that, uh, and, and part of the argument that we received was, oh, well, you know, we don't have folks on the ground. You know, we don't provide direct services per se. Um, well, that doesn't mean that you can't. And in fact, you've been instructed uh, since 1991 to do that. 
So uh, that's the, the I, I just want to get on the record and to make sure that you have that 1991 executive order from Governor Dean. Uh, the, the second is there, there's already an example of uh, turnkey operations to get information out to business owners. And, you know, the Vermont Commission on Women, uh, the Center for Women in Enterprise, the um, Business Women's Network, which all focus on women-owned businesses are turnkey operations that ACCD can say, you know, we've got this going out, or the Department of Taxes can say, we've got this coming out, and they turn the key and they send the information out to tens of thousands of women-owned businesses. When we were asked to join ACCD in the, the COVID uh, economic recovery grants last year, we literally had to build the airplane as it was flying. I mean, they brought us in at the 11th hour and the 59th minute, um, which is why it took so long for us to expend the two and a half million dollars is because we were building the plane you know, as we, as we um, were flying. Well, we now have um, you know, an operating database of about 500 um, minority owned businesses across the state of Vermont. Our survey that, that you received last December um, really indicate that one, there needs to be better services that are outlined in H336. Um, um, more importantly, there needs to be better data collection and I, I just want to note the testimony that I sent to you from um, uh, Courtney Smith Wiseman, Wisemore, um, of her struggle at trying to extract information from state government. Now, this is really instructive because she just arrived in Vermont last summer from LA. Small business owner, brought her business to Vermont, but I asked her if she would pretend like she was a, you know, a new arrival with no business to try to negotiate the system as it currently stands. And it, it, it was a um, uh, you know, nightmare of horrors collectively. Now, individually, you know, one-on-ones that she had with folks in state government were great. But those individuals were not talking to each other. They, don't, they were not sharing information with each other. And when information was available, it was not consumer friendly. So was, to disaggregate data by industry, for example, of minority owned businesses that have state um, contracts is not an easy, was not an easy operation. Uh, so you know, looking at this from a sort of a macro level, we need to have better data collection analysis and it needs to be available um, in a consumer friendly format. Um, you know, we've talked for a decade now about the Secretary of State putting a checkoff box uh, on the application of, of new businesses, uh, totally optional if they want to indicate uh, the race of the owners. Uh, that has yet to materialize. Um, so the other, the other piece to this is the formation or organization of, of a BIPOC-led organization of, of BIPOC business owners that would parallel that which the uh, Center for Women in Enterprise or the um, Business Women's Network um, currently have. Uh, I don't know the origin stories of either of those two organizations. I, I do know that they uh, both provide uh, good, solid technical assistance to women-owned businesses. And you know, we partnered with the women, women's um, uh, uh, 
the Center for Women and Enterprise. Uh, we partnered with them last year uh, to provide some of the technical assistance. Uh, we provided technical assistance to BIPOC businesses that were applying for uh, economic recovery grants. Um, and then we sort of passed the baton on to the Center for Women and an enterprise. So I'm going to leave it at that for questions. Um, but I wanted to one get on the record that this belongs in ACCD. There's precedent for it. Um, that we need to have an organization. And if state government, if you are in the position of underwriting the cost of that, uh, that would be great. Uh, and third, data collection analysis and consumer friendly delivery. Thank you. Lynn? Yeah, thank you. I think Curtis Reed brings up a really good point. A lot of the women's groups that have evolved over the years provide this kind of technical support and they've been active for many years. And, um, and I'm not sure if they're all located in ACCD or if they're just nonprofit organizations that function independently or they evolved out of something that maybe the government started along the way and became nonprofits. But um, I see that there's a couple of organizations here that um, maybe I'm gonna ask the people in these organizations to explain what kind of things they do for their members and what they do to create this technical support. And is this the basis of something that can uh, replicate or do the same kinds of things that these women's groups do. I know Emil does the Financial and Alliance and the Vermont Professional Professionals of Color Network seems to have uh, an organization that covers a, probably a variety of people. What exactly do these institutions do that can go and you can build on this support that, that the BIPOC community needs? Mm -hmm. uh well, for our part, we regularly send out information uh, of certainly around the, the, the COVID economic grant recovery program. Um, you know, provided technical assistance to, to about 100 or so minority-owned businesses across the state. Um, our footprint as an organization is statewide. Um, and in fact, probably most of the other folks that are on this list receive or have received information from us um, uh, about ongoing efforts. There are um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that for the moment. Yeah, I can, I can certainly speak from my side of the fence. Um, so the Black Financial Alliance, really, we're in the still in the inception phase of collecting and centralizing representation for the community as a whole. So really, the idea is to have representation not only from the business owner standpoint, but also from the professional standpoint, service professionals, as well as Black focused and Black led organizations. But centralizing representation has been where we've started and done most of our work thus far. We're still not fully registered and off the ground as of yet, but certainly for us, the way that we took a look at doing this work, we just felt like there was a critical gap in communication central representation for the Black community in Vermont. And we're starting to try to put all of those pieces together. So beyond creating, trying to, to put together a central point for there to be easy access recognition. And, and I think Curtis's point about data collection is, is absolutely critical um, for us to be able to work together. We have to know where everybody is in the space. And certainly that's one of the big focus points of the group and, and the work that we're doing as it stands currently. But to pretend that we are structured or operationalized to the point of being able to disseminate large scale services across any capacity at this point would be completely false. It might as well be me working out of my mom's basement at this point in time, trying to fill a gap in a community that we feel is still underserved by the state and by the, the structures that support it currently. Yeah, just uh, piggybacking off of what Emiliana said, I agree with him 100%. And uh, the Vermont Professionals of Color Network, uh, while our primary focus is on uh, the advancements of the, the advancement of uh, professionals, you know, the, the upward mobility, we do focus as well on 
on businesses and entrepreneurs because they themselves are professionals. And so really our goal is to empower BIPOC businesses, organizations and entrepreneurs with the resources, uh, the community and the talent that is needed to stimulate and su sustain economic growth. And at the moment, um, our organization is only two years old. We did start in 2019, uh, but it's like Emiliana said, I mean, we, we still getting formed and there's still a lot of structure that needs to take place in order to harness all of the opportunities that are available to us and to the, available to uh, the BIPOC community. And prior to maybe, prior to the events that happened this last summer, that focus uh, wasn't there on us from the state or from local government or from the municipalities that are there. And only now we're starting to, to feel the love just by the virtue, for instance, uh, of being on this call. Um, so it's taken a long time to actually get uh, the, the, the power and the, the wind of the, the of the government and also of, of the, the players in the industry to kind of propel us forward. And that had been the challenge that we had faced prior to, to the events of the summer. So we're glad that we actually now actually have a seat at the table, but there's a long way to go in getting the organization and the structure that's required in order to truly impact and serve the underrepresented communities um, of, this, of the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we are, the, the organization is 25 years old, the last 20 years we've spent um, in various endeavors, uh, the, the least of which I have to say is around economic development. Most of our work has been around um, institutionalizing uh, anti-racist behavior in public institutions and businesses across the state. It was just the, the, a, a stroke of luck that our low season is in the summer. Uh, and so when I got the call from Ted, Ted Brady, we just happened to have had the bandwidth to be able to do the economic recovery grant program. Uh, but we have four folks on staff and we don't have the, the bandwidth um, you know, to dedicate to the expansion of this idea of a BIPOC business association that would parallel the Center for Women and Enterprise or the Business Women's Network, or even the Commission for uh, on Women. Um, but you know, we 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 see the we see the need um, for doing this, um, but we don't we don't personally at Vermont Partnership have the bandwidth uh, to take that on right now. Charlie? Thank you, I can appreciate that. Thank you, Chris. And uh, I'm wondering, Emilio and Tino, or Wei Wei, I'm not sure who to uh, ask this question to, but looking five years from now, when your organizations are really getting started and not yet like fully formed in terms of like paying membership and that kind of thing, where do you see your two organizations, um, sorry, Curtis, uh, I want to get these two <laughs> to fight for you. Sure, Where do you see sure. your two organizations really in five years? I mean, how are you gonna, what does that look like in your vision? Um, I don't know if I am speaking over others, but, um, and I think Tino can support me in this. Right now we are in the process of, of becoming a 501c3 and we are really pushing ourselves, we have, uh, six board members um, and an intern working towards that process. So, and in the meantime, we are still offering services to um, our membership, which cons consists about uh, 250, 300 members um, across our platform. So, and that's statewide, I should mention, and we're um, gaining more membership um, on the daily. So um, we are working towards the the various goals that we have. You can visit our website at vtpoc.net um, to learn more about that. Um, Tino, I don't know if you have anything else that you'd like to add in regards to our, our future plans. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, like I said, uh, our, our mission really is to advance the 
networking and career development of uh, BIPOC members. Um, so really we're looking at driving uh, career and professional mobility by making sure that professionals of color have the capacity to, you know, become, uh, to, to get, to get proper career development, exposing them to career, to employment opportunities, and and also making sure that those that are already tenured professionals are given the space and the opportunity to become thought leaders and cultural and uh, professional competence counselors uh, so that they can become the ambassadors uh, of the younger generation and also be looked at as people that are in positions of, of authority. Because when you look at the reality is that, you know, you look at any sort of middle to upper level of management, you don't see any black and brown faces in there. So that's really what we're looking to do to, to try and uh, improve that, that mobility. But additionally, we're also looking to make sure that we promote the entrepreneurial ventures of, uh, of the business community, of, our, of the people that are members of our community. So not all these people uh, may consider themselves as professionals, but I do know, for instance, I've got a friend who owns an appliance and repair uh, company business, uh, a black man, and he considers himself as a professional, even though he's in the sort of the blue collar trade work. But those guys are professionals, and they're looking at trying to imp uh, increase their their business ventures to to get um, a bigger foothold, foothold into some of the opportunities that are being uh, presented out there. For instance, there's all sorts of new buildings that are going up. For instance. Is he getting a chance to be a part of that process where he can do all the installations in the new apartment buildings that are being set up on Dorset Street? Probably not. And yet we wanna make sure that uh, people like him are included in that equation. Uh, and then the, the last part is also making sure that we have a powerful professional network that can advocate on behalf of its members um, because you know, when decisions like this are being made, we're not currently uh, having a seat at the table. Uh, we're trying to make sure that we're included in, you know, the, um, the Chamber of Commerce, for instance, or the, the uh, Small Business Association. All these are the places where today, traditionally, we haven't had representation. We want to have a place where, for instance, when, when a bill like this is being considered, our, our membership and our, our people are being considered as well so that we can, we can also have a voice. Emiliano, I guess I'll throw it over to you. Yeah, I just want to know, Emma's hand's been up for a while. Emma, is there <laughs> I don't. I just don't want to just keep talking here. Um, okay, I think you're, you, you're continuing on um, Charlie's question and then I'll get to, uh, get to Emma. Fair enough. Um, so a couple things. I think that's a fair question, Charlie. Um, I, I think if the people in this room are looking to me to solve the issues for the community through the work that I'm doing part time beyond carrying two full time jobs and trying to do everything else that my life has to do, um, I don't feel very good about that. Um, I can certainly tell you folks that the vision that I have for, you know, five years, five months, you know, five weeks away from now is to continue to do work where I feel like there are critical gaps in our community and how it's being served currently. Um, I would certainly be considerably more interested in the opinions of this, you know, this group of individuals here on how you feel five years from now, you're putting together real things, legislation, support services that support the community that thus far, I don't think we've been able to do effectively. Um, and certainly from my perspective, I think it's important, or at least the way that, that we're approaching the issue is we have not found the help that we have been looking for from outside services or, or circumstances or, or other opportunities. So I think it is time, or at least from the Black Financial Alliance, we feel like there's an opportunity to look inward towards the community to be the savior and, and the opportunity provider for additional financial advancement opportunities within our community by creating a situation in a system of group economics where we connect small business owners, large business owners, medium business owners to service professionals, to black focused organizations, where potentially we can start to create these inroads between black communities as a whole. And, and certainly I think it applies to BIPOC, but certainly I, I just wanna respect the fact that I'm speaking from my own lived experience. Um, so certainly from the black perspective, we're looking at if there are organizations that are built and focused on placing 
new, you know, new Americans in Vermont that are black into some kind of job opportunities to connecting them directly to black businesses that are looking for new, you know, new body, new headcount, anything of that nature, connecting service professionals to Tino's point, we are working and having these conversations between the people that are on this call already as to try to figure out as how we can come together to plug the gaps where we feel like we currently live them in the community. So financial literacy opportunities from professionals that are in that service that can provide that to sole proprietor business owners that don't have necessarily the education or the background in order to structure businesses and go through all of the all of the motions that require them to run a successful business. So certainly long term, I'd love for us to create some kind of situation, at least from our side of the fence, where the black community has become the community that services and provides these services for ourselves that we have not been able to find in any other capacity and to create singular representation for it to be very easy for a large scale allyship to be brought to the table as well. So from my perspective, that's about as far as we've gone on a five year plan, but to be perfectly honest, you know, and I think it's interesting, <clears throat> Charlie, um, but if, again, if, if it's not, if it, belongs with us that represent less than 13 pop, you know, percent of the American population to solve the issues that apply to us as a whole, we're in more trouble than we might think. Um, and I'd certainly be considerably more interested in hearing the opinions of the people in this room as to how you feel like you can bring fundamental change within the next five years. And I think we're here to support and provide, you know, experience from, from what we get to live on a daily basis, but you guys hold the keys. You, and I'm sorry, you guys, you folks hold the keys and, and everybody holds the <laughs> dollars that come in the state and if you're not if this is not a, a focus and a priority item for you and if you're not interested in in coming up with creative solutions to bridge the gap and the onus and the responsibility is on you know the single folks of the community that are present here today and and I think Tino voiced his opinion about this being really the first time that we get a seat at the table in this capacity to have this conversation I think we have a lot more work to do. Emma? Well, I'm glad you went first, Emiliano. Um, thank you for that. Um, so I, I wanted to sort of build off of uh, the last couple of um, parts of testimony. And because I think part of what my inquiry is around, not necessarily what the state can do for um, the BIPOC business owners and a potential BIPOC business network or organization, whatnot, but like reversing it the other way and really looking at this, how does the state investing in the asset of our BIPOC businesses to better inform economic development policy by the state, to better inform how the state is not, you know, meeting um, the needs of BIPOC community members, and to really flip that into kind of an um, an asset for the state going forward, building off of what Emiliano was just saying around, you know, the value add for to, for really putting um, this idea forward. So, I I know, you know, it's been interesting just two months on this committee, seeing who's who has this, ha, is able to come to these committee meetings and knows about these committee meetings and can engage easily, and those who don't. Um, around the business community. And so I'm really curious to the point on advocacy um, and the idea of representation around that idea of what, what folks here today could say around the benefit to the state for the state to really um, uh, invest in either you know, a, a separate organization and really help stand up that BIPOC um, organization and help get that be successful and sustained and or in more inside pieces. So there's another idea here around resourcing ACCD, which is the Agency of Commerce and um, uh, uh, Community Development, not economic, Community Development, ACCD. Uh, and sort of, you know, a two, I'm thinking like a two-part approach because there is a state piece of this that I'm curious around, you know, making sure that we're building adequate relationships and making sure that the state is, is showing up and meeting, meeting this great economic development um, opportunity for the entire state. Um, I, I like to start off with two things. First is that there are BIPOC businesses across the entire state. I, I think we fall into this trap of being uh, Chittenden County centric, um, but we have BIPOC businesses that are all over the state. And, and, and so I, I think a solution is a statewide organization. Um, the way that uh, Emilio and Weiwei have described what they're doing is really sort of local in terms of Burlington and Chittenden County. Um, so I just want to remind everyone that there's more to Vermont than just Chittenden County. Uh, the second is that there are, we are losing millions and millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars 
that leave the state that BIPOC businesses that are that do business with the state that live in Connecticut, that live in New York, that live in Maryland, Virginia, uh, they're sucking those dollars out of the state. And this, our local communities are not benefiting from those state contract dollars um, because the, the foreign BIPOC business owner is spending his or her cash uh, and profits in the communities in which they live and the states in which they live. So I think there's an enormous uh, opportunity to help strengthen our local economies if we substituted, you know, the, the I think it was $83 million last year of, um, that went to BIPOC businesses outside of the state of Vermont. Imagine what the $83 million would do for Vermont local communities. I just want to have a point of clarification. We are, the Vermont Professionals of Color Network is a statewide organization. Okay, I stand corrected. Now, um, what you were just talking about, Curtis, is the, the, the state contracts um, going out of state. Is it because the when the contracts go out, um, the notice isn't going to BIPOC owned companies in Vermont. Um, just going- There's only one point of reference for state contracts in the state. Um, and then there are obstacles just in terms of um, sort of completing the bid contract, the bid application that requires the kind of financial literacy and digital liter literacy to complete um, to complete that. If you're a small uh, sole proprietorship, you may not have the, the muscle as it were of a full accounting department that can generate reports. Um, you know, you might be doing your, your financials on the back of an envelope as opposed to, um, you know, having a bookkeeper and so those are the kind of barriers that are keeping Vermont BIPOC businesses to belly up to the bar, so to speak. Now, there are some that are doing that. Um, getting data on them is incredibly difficult, which is why it's really important that the data collection, analysis, and dissemination in a consumer-friendly way is so critically important. And you know, we, we can put notices out as to, you know, contracts that are coming up, but then there's follow through, it takes staff time to, you know, sort of follow through with individual businesses, um, you know, to, to see who's interested, to see what kind of technical assistance they need. Uh, and in, in many cases, uh, it is, it costs more to apply for a bid that you might not win, that you could have spent that money and that time and effort uh, trying to grow your business in other ways. Mark, good morning. Uh, glad to have you with us. We haven't heard from you yet. Morning, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> good morning, committee and colleagues. Uh, Appreciate the opportunity to uh, come out for record. Mark Hughes, uh, Executive Director of Justice for All in the um, Racial Justice Alliance. So I, I wanted to just uh, thank you for the opportunity to come out. And I, I um, am definitely listening to um, a lot of the comments from my colleagues. And, um, and I think um, the perspective that I wanted to offer really goes to um, just the perspective that you know, we have, as you all, I think everybody on the call knows that we've been working on for the last uh, maybe six years or so, and that is to um, to address systemic racism in Vermont. And so we we view uh, the challenge here as being um, obviously much more. Um, it's it's a um, 
incredibly broad challenge that we're um, struggling with. The, um, the work uh, involves, yes, uh, policy work as we're talking about right now. And, and you see, um, for those of you, I, I think there's not a legislator on this call that did not receive our notification on ACT at the beginning of the se session act uh, and the work that's uh, going towards addressing um, disparities across housing and education, employment, health services, access, economic development, the so-called criminal justice system, uh, and you know, and how all of this stuff connects is just incredibly complex. But I think um, you know the challenge is is that we just getting getting everybody in the room to acknowledge the fact that systemic racism is even a thing. Uh, so um, I think we're getting there. And I think if we are getting there, we have to um, come to terms with uh, understanding that uh, we, we have to deal with this within that context. Um, and I think it's unfortunate, but it's um, I suppose timely that uh, the um, those of us who represent these uh, diverse communities and I refuse to acknowledge minority because we are majority minority. Uh, we black and brown people are a majority of the planet. Um, but I would say um, that this group of black and brown folks has, has never come together uh, until, until this time. So that's, that's challenging, but we'll keep working at it. Um, I think the solution to the problem is ours uh, to fix. Um, I, I think you can help um, if you listen to us. Um, there is a wealth of, of uh, information that, that's available that's out there on uh, some of the stuff that we're working with in some of the other places. We are moving in the right direction. I encourage you to, um, to take a look at and strongly consider adopting the language of H406. Uh, this is our economic development, uh, our, our, the Racial Justice Alliance's economic development bill. Um, it should be on your wall by now. Uh, it endeavors to um, address uh, multiple uh, questions that have come up uh, until now. Um, and I, I guess um, just to back up a little bit, just to, to talk about how our systems are, um, you know, in a um, framework of systemic racism, how our systems are meeting our needs, black and brown folks. Um, you see the systems are working perfectly. Uh, they're not broken. They were never designed to, uh, uh, to address black and brown folks' needs. Um, they, were they were tailored for white people. We believe this. Uh, there is already a, um, a, a um, technical assistance program in the uh, ACCD's office is not working for us. Uh, it never has. And uh, I think Curtis's comment was, good to see you too, Curtis, uh, 1991. 1991, so it's not working. So, so we 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 agree that there should be something in the in the ACCD's office that that is, um, you know, serving in some type of capacity for technical assistance. But if you take a closer look at the policy that we put forward, we also agree that, uh, you know, consistent with what Curtis said, because Chittenden County is not the whole state, that this should be a regional approach that this should be a dis decentralized effort. And we, we think that a lot of this work should be done on a regional basis and organizations should be entrusted to manage this outside of the current structure because the current structure is uh, not serving us. And it's the same conversation that we were having on 210 this morning, H210 in, in uh, health, the current system is not serving us. So we're asking for to do it different. Uh, the current system in public safety is not serving us will be asking for you to do that different as well. Um, black people, brown people are not broken. We don't need to do anything different. We don't need to comport to the system because the system wasn't designed for us. We need to figure out ways to make our own systems or else we need to figure out ways to create systems that reach black and brown folks. That's what we're here to do. Um, I think that, um, you know, just a little bit of background. We're working really hard here in, in Burlington on Operation Phoenix Rise and we're doing similar work. Uh, we're doing similar work across all systems, not just uh, public safety, but uh, we're talking about housing and education, employment, health services, ac access, the whole nine yards. We're looking at uh, reimagining uh, 
this uh, community, uh, folks are embracing uh, some of this stuff about um, the um, Operation Phoenix Rise. We're even looking at transportation with the right way here, as opposed to Champlain Parkway. Let's do it different. Um, and we've also declared racism a public health emergency, as well as the first uh, city to do it like this in the nation. Um, there's a reparations task force here. So there's a lot of stuff that's in play. And I think that this is really important work that we're doing, but community engagement and support um, and you know, is, is, is also a big part of it. We granted about maybe $40,000. I know it's a small number compared to the $2.5 million that Curtis gave away, but we're just finding our sea legs in the community. So we figure out how do we put money in people's hands, um, but also uh, financial empowerment. Uh, I, don't, I don't really believe in literacy. We tried that a couple hundred years ago, but the financial, the, the whole financial uh, clearing obstacles for economic opportunity, I would prefer to say home and land ownership. Yes, we do. We are supporting a policy regarding home and land ownership, but also personal and career development. These are all very important components in the work that we're doing as an organization. And yes, we're a statewide organization, but also at the same time, there's other activities that must happen. And the reason why it's important for me to uh, break this down to you is, is because I think it's really important to see a, the broad brush of the work that we have to do, that we are doing to dismantle systemic racism and view this work as a, within the context of that work. And I know some of you are saying, all right, already be done and, and leave. And, and, but the point is, is that I don't know that you're going to hear this anywhere else. That's what I came to tell you is, is I don't know. Um, so I'm going to take the time to try to explain this to you. You know, we're also doing and others are doing and many are doing in different ways, outreach and education across the state, even to your own constituents about what this thing is. This thing called systemic racism, webinars, platform series, film viewings. OK, this work needs to be funded, too. So the, as, uh, as as organizations, we're doing this work. Um, we got to make sure that if we're talking about funding things, we're talking about all of the things. And, and then one of, probably one of the biggest things, and I think is the most important thing, is cultural empowerment. How do we get after commemorations and celebrations, affinities and activities and workspaces and so forth, uh, in safe spaces rather, because this is what this is what really contributes to and lifts up the wellness of black and brown folks. So we can do the work. So it's not just about owning businesses. It's also about personal and career development so you can move yourself to a place where you can own a business. So you can get, so you can move beyond a place where you're just working for somebody or just trying to make things meet. Now I'll conclude with, just a couple of things out of this policy. And you know, on the record, I, you know, I, I, am, in, I am in support of moving forward uh, with some level of technical assistance. And, but it's just that I think that we got to be able to do two things at the same time. I think we, we've got to be able to do this because we know there's going to be a huge tranche of money coming down. Um, God bless us all because the way it was handled last time, you know, not to point fingers or anything like that is, it's just that the money didn't, it, we couldn't effectively get the money to where it needed to go. And um, that's on all of us. Um, but we also, we got to put ourselves in a position to, to be able to do better this time while at the same time plan for an infrastructure that, that really addresses the root of the problem, not just how we deal money out when we get it, but how do, how do we work towards eradicating the challenges of what creates this situation, whereas there is a need for a separate system to address BIPOC and American descendants of slavery. So this proposal with H406, you know, it talks about creating a department, not a program within the ACCD, a department. And it, it goes on, um, you know, and it gives some very high level um, prescriptions for a network. Uh, this is this is a um, you know basically a 
by black led by black led organizations, a, a grant program for qualified organizations and collaboratives, uh, led by by uh, American descendants of slavery or or um, the wider um, uh, BIPOC community, and in this this network would be you know the cent the central hub of this network would be the department within the ACCD, and um, it would also provide support for cultural empowerment programs regionally across the state, but business cultivation um, support programs, including technical assistance grants and loans, business mentorship programs, technical assistance, I think I said that small business procurement contract assistance. Um, see, all, all of these things currently exist in some form or, another, form or another within programs in the ACCD. They probably have about 12 programs. They also have technical assistance in the ACCD. It's not working. It's not working for this particular demographic of people. So I just want to keep driving that home. So let's stop trying to ask black and brown people to do something different. And let's comport what it is that we're doing as a state to meet them where they are. So, so, they can, so we can do better. Um, there's also coordinating personal and professional development in these uh, centers across this network, which starting from adult basic education, career development, personal and career co coaching. And I know what you're saying. You're probably thinking, well, there's regional development corporations, there's SBA, there's Capstone, there's CVC, there's CVC, CVEOE, you know what I'm trying to say. But the thing is, is that it's not working. It's not working. So all of these things uh, go together. Uh, delivery of wealth development programming, like financial man management, home and land ownership programming, investment management programming, all of this stuff goes together. And I think we're short-sighted. In conclusion, I think we're short-sighted and we do ourselves a huge disservice if we don't first empower black and brown people to handle our own business, get this taken care of on our own, uh, if we don't create the infrastructure and funding for them to do so, um, and if we don't view this within the context of a much broader issue, uh, which is how do we eradicate systemic racism? You know, Right now, what we're doing today is, is we are responding to COVID-19, which has exacerbated, excuse me, exacerbated all of these outcomes of these determinants, housing, education, employment, health services act. It has exacerbated, has raised it, our attention so we could see it more clearly, but it was here all of the time. These challenges were here all of the time. And all we're talking about right now is, is, is jobs in COVID. And we just, we gotta be able to contextualize it in a way to where we're actually institutionalizes, institutionalizing practices and processes, deconstructing uh, systems that contribute to it and have created the situation that we're in. Thanks for your time. And I'm gonna stick around and, and take some questions if there are any, and otherwise I'll just stick around and listen uh, to the rest of what my colleagues have to say. Thank you, Mark. Paul? Hello, uh, thanks everybody for coming to our committee and speaking. I think my question might be for Weiwei, as she mentions that her organization that she works with is statewide. Um, and and uh, the comment that Mr. Reed made about there being more to Vermont than just Burlington really kind of um, caught my ears, if you will. Uh, and I think of my rural communities, the four rural communities that I represent, and um, the challenges that the, the BIPOC community may face in these rural communities being, you know, further out from Burlington um, and more densely populated areas where they may feel even a little more isolated and alone. I'm wondering, you know, if, if there's any comments or, or if you can kind of speak to um, BIPOC issues and barriers in rural communities as it relates to business and, and economic development. I'm just curious to hear a little bit on that, if anybody cares to speak on that. I mean, I think I'm based out of Burlington and I grew up in South Burlington. So I don't know I, that I personally have any experience with that. Um, something like that, I would feel more comfortable talking with our members beyond and um, speaking with um, uh, folks like, for example, um, 
um, Wayne Anthony Miller, who um, is head of um, Living Proof. He's got that mentorship organization out in the Upper Valley. Um, he might have a better idea in terms of how folks are dealing with things in those in more rural areas. So for me personally, I can't, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the organization or the membership of the organization um, on, on that. Does that make sense? It sort of does. And that maybe leads me to another question is, you know, what, you know, I think you mentioned, and maybe I'm getting confused, maybe yeah. 250 members, I think it was. And yeah. do you know, like how many of those members reside in rural communities? Sure. And, yeah. You know, how um, well are they represented in your organization? Yeah. So in terms of our statewide reach, um, we have been gaining more statewide reach over the, uh, over COVID, to be honest, um, because it is hard when you are an organization organization that's starting up and um, especially pre-COVID times where, you know, we started off as a networking event um, group and then we built up to this organization. So we're still really building things out. Like Tino said, we're only two years old and we just recently got funding to become 501c3. And so we are working with um, other organizations across the state, other individuals across the state to really bring our, our services, our programming to them um, and to make it more um, obvious like what is happening in the more rural areas. Um, in terms of how many of the 250 members are from beyond, let's say Chittenden County or even the Montpelier area, um, I would have to look into our files, but I, I don't know that off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Well, I think, um, you know, every, uh, the, on all the testimony that I'm hearing today is definitely, you know, the BIPOC community certainly feels uh, a little forgotten, left out in economic development, which I can completely understand. And I think, you know, there definitely needs to be a solution. I'm glad we're all meeting and discussing this. My fear is also that, um, you know, I just hope we don't forget the rural communities either <laughs> in, in, in developing a right. solution because uh, can i speak yeah, to you definitely on rural communities um because I, I i agree with you 100 percent and in fact uh, i think that's some of the challenges um and let's just get real polit politically uh when you, you start talking about the decisions that you make uh on a regular basis and, and other members who are here um are reflective of your constituency and um, there could be certain decisions that you make that are career limiting if you're not careful. And those are the facts. Uh, so and I, I don't shy away from that conversation. I have them regularly with other committee members and of other committees in some of the chairs, um, like my good friend from, from um, well, I shouldn't say that, but I, anyway, I, what, I, what I will tell you is, is I've lived in Williamstown uh, and I'll tell you I've lived in Woodbury and I've lived in Cabot. I'll tell you, I have a brother who lives in Franklin. I think that might resonate with you. Uh, and I'll also tell you that um, some of the work that we've done across the state, um, because most of the time that I've been doing this work has been in central Vermont, not in Burlington. Uh, so our, our base was grown out of the, the Montpelier, Barrie, uh, Williamstown, Berlin, uh, uh, Northfield, the list goes on area, um, Middlesex. And I think that, um, you know, the relationships, and yeah, we're statewide as well, but the relationships we've established on some of our, our tours, you know, for example, when we did 40 Days of Fire, we, we were in Hardwick, we were in, you know, we were in Hartford, we were, we were in, you know, when we did the, um, the series on, um, you know, uh, Hidden in Plain Sight, The Truth About Systemic Racism, we started in the State House, if you recall, we started in Room 10 in the State House, and what we did is, is we took that uh, to Hartford and we went to Hardwick again and we, St. Albans and, and St. Johnsbury were on the schedule before we got shut down um, 364 days, 366 days ago. Um, I think the, um, you know, so the, as far as the rural community, you know, we're full aware, you know, in fact, there's also a relationship that we have on our cannabis work, which is, which intersects with and with full coalition partners with rural Vermont and Vermont Growers Association and NOFA. And so there's a lot of partnerships that we have there and begin to determine, you know, what some of those um, synergies are in terms of what we share, what we have in common. You know, we have a, there is a common goal 
uh, that small farmers and, and grow, small growers have with, with the BIPOC community as it pertains to our advancement in this cannabis conversation in terms of equity. Um, we were, that's one of the reasons why I was late for this conversation. Those conversations continue in the Senate House, uh, in the Senate Gov Ops and, and Judiciary, even now in S25. Uh, so yes, there's a lot of um, interaction, relationships, uh, because there are friends that come from these relationships as well. Christ, my brother lives on Lake Carmine. So, I mean, you talk, you want to talk Franklin. Uh, so there's, um, there's, there's a lot of um, work to be done still, uh, but um, I hear you. I want to let you know I hear you and your, your, uh, your comments are valid. Thank you. And I live in Franklin, by the way. <laughs> right. Um, so if, if I can answer your question with some anecdotes. Uh, so I've heard from many black and brown folks that are in the construction trades, for example, uh, that they're having a hard time holding on to good workers. And that's because their workforce is coming out of vocational schools that have a very limited view of the world. And so you bring in a new employee and you might get F-bombed or you might be called the N-word. Uh, and, and so the business is constrained to grow if you have a series of, if you have an uncertain workforce that is, doesn't wanna work with BIPOC owned businesses. Um, there's a challenge around capitalization and you know having relationships with a financial institution. I mean, I've, I've been in Vermont for 42, 42 years now. Uh, I have a banking relationship with the same bank for 42 years. I could, you know, call Peter and say, I need, you know, $50,000 line of credit and it, it wouldn't be a problem. But if you're a new business starting out, you don't have that relationship with your local bank or local financial institution. Um, and so some of that, some of the challenge that, um, that faced BIPOC businesses, most of which were formed in the last three, four, five years, um, you know, it's difficult for them to find the capital they need to grow. And in some cases, you know, personnel, staff that are not knuckleheads. Uh, so, but those are just sort of anecdotal. We haven't done any, any, any um, research on, the, on that aspect of, of business ownership. Would it be possible for me to just um, speak to um, Representative Martin's question again? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to say, um, like, as VTPOC Network is growing, um, we are working with NAACP of Rutland, and we are reaching out to NAACP of Wyndham County and all these other organizations. But I think it's very difficult to um, reach out to some some of the more rural, um, let's just call them constituents, um, for the the reasons that Emiliano had kind of talked about early on in terms of people don't know that we exist yet um, because there's not, the information is not necessarily out there. And a lot of our membership is gained through word of mouth and people are like, oh, did you know about this? And then people sign up. So as we flow, we are gaining more of that traction with rural um, membership. So I, I just want to address that, um, if that helps answer mm -hmm. your question a little bit more. Yeah, there, there's an old um, dictum that says, how do you find a needle in a haystack? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and it's, you need to have a magnet that's strong enough. Yeah. And I think what we're seeing here is that there are local organizations that are expanding their reach but they're not yet at the level of the magnet large enough to attract. For my partnership, we're just we're, we're just um, a repository of information right now. 
in, in terms of BIPOC businesses. Um, like I said, that's not our principal wheelhouse, um, but you know we're in this space because we know that there's um, that there's work to be done and that there's legislation that needs to get that needs to move forward. And I'm really happy that there's Emilio and Weiwei. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I can retire soon, knowing that uh, <laughs> that you guys are out there. Um, so, yeah. Curtis, if you can't get my name right, don't think about retiring anytime soon. Okay. <laughs> and if you can't say mine. <laughs> Mark, I can say yours. Hey, I wanted to just um, piggyback on to what um, our friends at, um, at the network are communicating. Uh, Cause we were on, I was on recently with a call with them and I just want to lift, I really want to lift up what they're doing and we'll figure out ways to do that on our site as well in in and in collaboration and i just i and i want to i want the committee to imagine to envision collaboratives as well um because we don't need you to get this together we're gonna we're gonna figure this out and we're gonna get this together as organizations and as people um and we're gonna do better that's my commitment uh to my friends um but um as we do so i think that there is an opportunity for a, um, you know, some some you know some pretty interesting work that we could do uh, collaboratively with the with the legislature. Um, you know, I will definitely, you know, be tracking down um, most of you know all of my colleagues that are on this call. Some of us have hit and miss prior to this meeting, but I, I do think that um, collectively uh, there there's a lot of potential for um, uh, to advance this conversation and, and again i'm i am biased uh because i'm framing this conversation in systemic racism eradication and this is part of that work um but i think that this is a good place a good conversation for me to be in uh surrounding that work and i think we've got mostly all the right people at the table and having the conversation so i i appreciate um you bringing us in and and again we'll be um making sure that um, we make that magnet stronger uh, for, for the network as well. Charlie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mark, I have a question for you. Um, and that a lot of the description of the struggles of small businesses that have been described today are universal across any, but any business that is starting. And trouble accessing services, uh, not knowing what to do, not having the financial literacy, and so we try to address that with general programs. And what you were saying is that the system was not set up, and it's not designed to really cater to people of uh, in the BIPOC community. And what I want to really, really understand before we go to ACCD uh, and say you really need to have representation for the BIPOC community is, can you tell us how in this pandemic? Uh, and looking at the system that was set up to really respond to that, how the community was not well served. I say that, I ask that question knowing that you probably have a 20 minute speech on that, but just, just trying to get some, I, uh, I'm joking, uh, trying to get some specifics around that. Can, can you restate your question? <laughs> just thinking about, what you were saying was that the system really wasn't set up to be able to address the needs of the BIPOC business community. And I'm looking for specifics in which that has actually occurred and trying to figure and trying to better understand that. I don't, I don't really have an answer to that question right now. I mean, when you say specifics, when you say specific, where, where I get thrown off on that question is, is when you say specifics to how that has occurred. I don't have, for example, I don't have specifics on how we got 11% of prison population on black people when we only have 1.4% uh, black folks in the state. I can't give you those specifics on how that actually happened because uh, largely it's because everybody's pointing at each other. Uh, and, um, and secondarily, because it is a system that has created it. 
Um, I, you know, and I could go on and on with the list of, you know, the expulsions from people in school. But I can tell you, um, you know, in terms of, you know, the education outcomes and, you know, I can't give you like specifics. Um, but what I can tell you is, is I can certainly give you um, some outcomes. Uh, and I think, you know, Sue Zeller would tell you that outcomes are important. Uh, and, and I think the, um, the outcomes that we have right now is, is we've, we've got a, you know, a bunch of black and brown folks uh, that I know and that I represent, uh, some of whom I represent, and, um, and a whole lot of stories about inaccessibility or just no knowledge whatsoever of existence of certain services. Um, you know, and I, when I pair that with stuff like, I, you know, like the prison conditions, you know, and I'm challenged on it, sometimes um, I just ask people, especially, you know, people with, uh, white people with political and economic power, I ask them, I, you know, I say, you know, could it be that, you know, there are systems, especially since this exists across all systems and we have empirical data that supports that, could it be that black and brown people are, are just inherently less smart than white people? Could it be that we are just inherently more criminal? Um, if that's the case, if that's the justification, then I'd like, to, I'd like to hear it from you and I'd like to hear it from folks here on this committee. If it's not, then I think we've got some, some systems problems that we gotta work out, but specifics I don't have for you today. Yeah, because I, I think what you're addressing is mostly one of communication and making sure that folks know that these that that the programs are available. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out if that's the major issue or if it's some kind of other nefarious program that's going yeah, on. Yeah, I get I get where you're going, where you're coming from. Yeah. And just a quick redirect before um, you know, the chair acknowledges Emiliano, I guess this is just that um yeah, I, I think that it's important to get to the specifics. The question is, is when do we get to the specifics? And I think that this whole, um, this whole concept, this data collection, by the way, this data thing, I've been screaming data for the last five years, data across all systems of state, racially disaggregated data across all systems of state government. We've got policy on that as well as where, you know, some people are, you know, a day late and a dollar short, just trying to get Tutana Davis and another couple of bodies. We're trying to get her a data infrastructure so we can get racially disaggregated data across all systems. And oh, by the way, actually give her some authority. Um, but that's another conversation. But the point here is, is that that data collection, um, that, that uh, strategy, that initiative, you know, it's not just a state initiative. We too, uh, Curtis has, has demonstrated it's possible. He's already started some level of outreach. We'll be doing some of that, particularly as it pertains to COVID in the very, very near future. Um, you know, we could talk about vaccinations, but we won't. Um, but the thing here is, is just that um, there is a lot of data that needs to be collected in these areas. And I think that as we continue to do the work, Representative Kimball, and, and identify what needs to happen now uh, because of the sense of urgency, because this is an emergency, um, what we should probably do is, is commit to collecting those data so we can get after the answers, uh, the, the answers to the questions that you're asking right now. I hope right. that helps. Yeah, thank you. Emiliana? Yeah, and if I can just kind of piggyback off that question, Representative Kimball, I think it's, I think if the solution was as simple or the problem was so, as simple as singular elements or singular components, then I think it would be resolved and would have been resolved a long time ago. Um, I think the issue with a ton of the end symptoms that the black community is faced with, with in particular is due to the systemic nature and the intersectionality of all of these contributing factors that lead to that final endpoint. And that's prevalent in access to financial capital, lack of representation, incarceration rates, all of those things. And I, I certainly think there's a tonality to framing problems and certainly problems of this size and scale with that particular lens that certainly ties quick wins together, but by no means addresses larger salute, larger issues that come together to create these end problems. So I would, I would just, and, and this is simply my opinion, I think, again, if it was so simple as, hey, what, where are we specifically missing the mark on a couple of things that make it so if we adjust these small pieces, the problem solves itself. If it was that simple, you're sitting and surrounded by a room full of, I'm sure, quite intelligent people. And, and certainly from the community standpoint, I, at least I consider myself to be slightly educated and intelligent. 
Um, I think if it was so simple as, as identifying specific things that make it so that we come up short, not only would we have identified those, addressed those and resolved those, but I think, you know, there's, there's some, I think there's some danger to framing this, the size and scale of this issue with that particular lens and focus. And I would just encourage the group as a whole to be aware of the perspective that there are so many culminating and converging factors that result in the end product that this community and the BIPOC community face as a whole, that if we start to look at it in, hey, what are the quick wins or specifically where do we miss the mark? We miss the mark all across the board. And that's what results in specific symptoms occurring in a bunch of different capacities. So as much as I think it's important for us to have a targeted approach, and I think maybe that's more of the conversation that's, that's worth having, um, I would just heavily encourage everybody to be aware and conscious of the fact that intersectionality across a multitude of factors and social circumstances are what result in the end product that we are all trying to find a solution for. And I think it's disserving for us to try to appear to, to put you know, small specific wins on the table by tackling specific items. But again, that's just my opinion. And I just wanted to round out the answer to that question. Curtis. Um, I, I just, I need to leave at noon. And if there are any other questions for me, um, I'll take a stab at them before I, before I sign off. Okay. Yeah, I think we're all um, going to leave at noon as well. We'll follow you out. Um, or lead you. Paul? I think I just have one last thing. I, I, I kind of, I, I think I really understand Rep Kimball's question. And um, I, I, in that, you know, I think a little more, some specifics and uh, maybe some real life testimony from some of these business owners that have faced challenges would really be helpful for us because I'm looking at our committee and I don't think we have anyone that is a member of the BIPOC, BIPOC community on our committee. Um, so, you know, really looking uh, for specifics and some guidance on, you know, how we can in, eliminate some of those barriers or, or lower some of those barriers, I think would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm a, I'm a member of a minority community as a gay person, and I understand those issues that I have faced uh, in my own businesses and business dealings um, and just life in general. So, you know, for us to sit here as a, you know, predominantly or, or a white, really a white committee, um, I think makes it a, a little difficult, and mm -hmm. I'm sure you all understand that. So. Uh, it's kind of, I think, what's being said. So I think, I think what Rep. Kimball is saying, and I think I feel the same way. And I guess I don't want to speak for Rep. Kimball, but um, I think a little, you know, a little more guidance on how exactly um, we should move forward would be helpful, if that makes sense. Um, but that's just maybe my final comment. Mm. Mr. Chair, if I may. Sure. I think. Um, First of all, I own three businesses, and I um, and I um, I think you know, in all fairness to uh, to Charlie or to Representative Kimball's um, comment, you know, that there's there are there are there's stuff to be learned, and I think that I want to be careful to 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 make sure. I think it's important that it's also understood, and yeah, I'm, I'm happy to come back and give and give talk and speak more to this from a business perspective. Today I'm speaking for the Alliance, but I think it, there is a, um, there's a lot to be said about um, when people of color, you know, come together and organize and identify uh, some of the, um, some of the challenges and put forward, and I think I mentioned earlier, um, policy um, and put forward you know certain recommendations on uh, h406 i think i mentioned um you know transparently i have to you know i have to express you know make sure that i'm expressing a little bit of frustration because um we're literally telling you what to do we're giving you a framework uh we're putting the policy right in front of you glad to come back and testify um to that policy but you know to and I know the policy is pretty fresh on your wall, and I know you're, you're working on this massive behemoth policy that you're going to move by the end of this, whatever this is. Um, but um, 
before you start asking for stories, we kindly ask you to read the policy that we gave you. Uh, and um, we'd also ask you to, you know, to consider taking it up so we can come back and tell our stories within the context of, of, of testimony of that policy. Uh, because uh, I believe strongly that we put forward some really um, um, novel and, um, and um, very creative approaches to addressing the challenges that are, um, that's, that are in front of us. And, and frankly, um, there's, there's some other challenges that we, we struggle with. Is it's, it's very difficult to get people to come before um, the legislature and, and testify because, because we don't trust you and, and they don't either. And, and there, there's been so much harm that's been done by the legislature to uh, people of color recently, especially our women, um, just recently. So that's a challenge that we're trying to work through, and I, I, I will just flag that and say this is the, you know, this is the, the most. Uh, I'll just say this is the coolest committee I've been in so far. So just take that. But th the thing is, is that um, that's a challenge. It is a challenge. You know, just if we're, you know, I came to testify, but I'm gonna. I also came to be honest with you and be and be tr truthful and transparent. So it there's that. And then the last piece that, and this is just what you, I just ask you to consider is is Black and brown people are tired of telling you stories. Um, I think that we've been we've been telling you stories. I've been here for a dozen years, um, and I hadn't really seen much of anything change. You know, we moved Act Fifty Four, racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel, uh, with the attorney generals and the human rights commission's task force back a little while ago. We it, it was our work that created Susanna Davis's position in the panel that supports her. We've been telling we've been telling you stories. Um, since stories were, were told uh, and have been seeing very, very little um, progress. And I think white, uh, black, some black folks are getting tired of white voyeurism, trauma voyeurism. Um, so, so you gotta take that into account as well. It can be done, um, but I think just, you know, one of the things is, I think is super important, Mr. Chairman, is, is, is just, you know, let's just be mindful of the fact that, you know, there's folks on the other side of the table that are that are in fact traumatized and, and that have been trying to work through these things for quite some time and there's trust issues and, um, and there is uh, some fatigue. Uh, so I appreciate that Representative Martin. I, I, I receive it well, um, but I just wanted to just give you the flip side of it. Thanks. Yes, and, and, and we, we, we sent out a notice at the beginning of the session to everyone in our database and asking them if they wanted to testify. And if they did, I think we sent a couple to Emma and a couple to Sarah Coffey. Um, but small business owners are in the business of trying to stay afloat and coming to testify before the, the legislature is pretty low on, on the priority list. And I do wanna echo um, Mark's uh, commentary around trauma tourism and, and analysis paralysis. You have enough information, I believe, to be able to make a decision. So anyway, I need to sign off. Thank you again for the opportunity and uh, be well. Thank you, Curtis. Sure. Mr. Chair, I just want to mention, I, I hope my comment didn't come off as insensitive. I'm a, I'm a brand new legislator, I'm 28 years old. so. Um, you know, it, I, I did not want that to come off as insensitive. I hope it didn't, because that's not. Not, not at that's all. Okay. Not at all. Uh, so, so Paul, I mean, uh, Representative Martin, not, not that that wasn't that absolutely not. I want to I want to make sure that you know we walk away because it's you know as we interact with the legislature, um, you know, from my perspective and, and as far as alliance is concerned and some some people from other committees may, may tell you well mark just came in and lit us up maybe i did but you know there's there's no there's no reason um to you know for us to to come in in, in here hostile today um I'm, for me to come in here hostile um i you know i i really mean it i and i and i know that some here are in other committees i won't call your names out um but i will say that um this committee has is is probably is definitely the most receptive and um, the you know the most open committee that I've spoken to, and I think this is the sixth place I've testified 
uh, this session. So, um, you know, compliments to the chair, um, but also uh, those of you who invited us here. So um, absolutely not Representative Martin. Uh, there could be nothing further from the truth. Yeah, I'd echo that. But yeah, I think we're all figuring it out, right? I, yeah, I wouldn't feel any kind of way about it. Well, we appreciate that. Um, I think, you know, last fall when we heard that there was an issue of, of getting the money that we had set aside for um, the BIPOC business community, that, that they were having a hard time getting that money out. Um, we, coming back, want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And um, we want to do what we can to um, make sure that um, the BIPOC business community is, is being heard, number one. Um, number two, that they have access um, to technical support, um, have access to um, other state functions that everybody else does. And number three, we want to make sure that their businesses are successful. We want to make sure that all businesses in Vermont are successful. Um, it's just better for the better for the good of the state and for good of all our communities. So um, with that, I want to thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank you for the conversation. Um, we will do our best to um, see what we can do um, and to um, and to try to support you as much as we possibly can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having um, me. And I also would just uh, leave as a, as a note um, for consideration, because I, I know we're going to be trying to do um, a lot in a very short period of time. And um, I don't think anybody here wants to do what we did last time. So I, I would ask uh, that you would that you would consider that the committee would consider how do we, you know, how do we do this in a way to where we don't have respectfully one point of one single point of failure. Um, I would I would ask I would ask that you consider how do you go about uh, creating multiple access points uh, and also uh, to to Curtis's point, um, the rest of the state's not Chittenden County. Um, but let me just flip that up on its ear. <clears throat> Chittenden County is not the rest of the state. So what that means is, is that if there's something going on in the other part of the state, there's an equal level of isolation if it's not Chittenden County centric. So riddle that. So there, there must be uh, some type of, um, I would say compartmentalization because there should be some kind of centralized um, mechanism in place, but there, there should be uh, some type of disaggregation uh, to, to the extent that, you know, like Representative Martin's up in Franklin. Franklin's different. You know, I got, you know, one of my church members are up in Frank, is up in Franklin too. My brother's in Frank. Franklin's different. It's just different. It's different from Chittenden. Um, so there's, there's respectfully, but there is a, um, there are a lot of different nuances about how to get money to BIPOC folks. Uh, and that is one of them. Um, so I would just leave that with you respectfully. And I'd ask you to take that into consideration. And, you know, I, you know, I stand at the ready to, you know, to support this effort in any way. Um, and I, I support the work of this committee. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you all very much. Um, um, committee, I think it's lunchtime now. Um, we have the floor at 1.15. Um, we do appreciate um, everyone that joined us this morning.